uh, it's also what he does all throughout his work where he is working through memories um, so when he's in the Caribbean, he's not doing any um, actual collage works. He does a lot of watercolors, but then he gets back um, to his studio in New York on Canal Street, and he's doing these beautiful Caribbean works, too, um, so these collage works. So it goes both ways, I think, but all through his life, it's about memory and metaphor and these things that he learned about, um, you know, Southern life. And he does this, you know, even in the 60s um, for the projection series that he's known probably best for. Um, he does a whole series of collage, um, 21 of them, I believe. And each of them sort of go through a cycle. Um, you know, there's rural scenes. There's one called Cotton. Um, and these scenes of um, the landscape, the Southern landscape. And then he has these city scenes, these very clearly urban street scenes, the street, the dove, and um, interior scenes. And, um, and it turns out that this is a cycle that he does in the 60s, but he ends up doing all of these sort of topics throughout his life. But um, I think that the southern landscape was something that was really a part of who he was. And um, you know, so when you go to Charlotte and you see this park, and you see the you know sort of pride that Charlotte takes in um, him coming out of Charlotte. It's really a wonderful, wonderful testament to um, his own memory. Yeah. Thank you, Allison. Uh, Lemire Bearden's work often depicts very strong women. Do you want to talk about the role women play in his work? Yeah, Deirdre mentioned this idea mm -hmm. that in his family, this multi generational family, there were a lot of women, a lot of strong women. So you have grandmothers, you have great-grandmothers, in addition to his own mother, um, Bessie. And she was certainly a figure that I think gave him a good role model in terms of what it is that a person can achieve, um, how you can be involved with people on a very personal level, as well as on an institutional level, going back to some of your initial comments about his role in, say, helping to establish the Studio Museum of Harlem, other boards that he sat on, and um, you know, other kinds of actions that he took, particularly maybe the second half of his career, because his mother was um, the first black woman to sit on a local school board in New York. She worked um, with a, a lot of different institutions and organizations in New York. She sat on their boards. Um, she worked with the Democratic Party. She had other jobs. Um, defender. Right, mm -hmm. yes, certainly that's a, um, thank you for mm -hmm. reminding me of that. She was the New York editor for the Chicago Defender. So this is a, a periodical that reaches African Americans across the country. And um, it's, uh, he started write, doing some writing for them as well. And later on, as he developed sort of early on in his career, he continues to write for newspapers and magazines and to do art uh, for them, political cartoons, cover art. And I think that that sort of stems from his mother's uh, role and sort of giving him that ability to express himself. And of course, we think of Bearden as a visual artist. But as I know many of you know, he also was involved in so many other things, and writing was among them. So certainly, I think that comes from his mother, and just that she was a really strong presence. And his father was, by most accounts, maybe more introverted, quieter. Um, his mother is always described as um, more extroverted, um, and certainly always involved with things. And really, you know, we might describe her today as kind of a people person. Um, we like a, to say a force. A force, <laughs> exactly. That is a, a great word. And she was incredibly successful, and you know, I think always pushed herself and pushed her son. And um, you know, he got a lot of attention being an only mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that there are a lot of things that we could look at about her and her career and see how those things played into his career, the art that he created, um, and the, the voice that he had may be slightly different than hers because a lot of that is his visual voice. But he was certainly very active. I mean, we could consider him an advocate during the civil rights era, an activist, and a lot of those things I can see coming from his mother. And then, as well as the other female members of his family, the, um, you know, his grandmother that he spent time with in Pittsburgh. Um, his grandmother ran a boarding house, and um, he spent time, he graduated from high school in Pittsburgh. 
living with her, and then, of course, his grandmother and great-grandmother that he spent time with here in North Carolina. And, and I believe that his grandmother lived here in Greensboro, if I'm not mistaken. So um, yeah. it was his great-grandparents, really, that lived in, that continued to live in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that his aunt and grandmother ended up spending time in Greensboro. So, but all incredibly strong women. And just, if I could say one final thing, you see this in his art. And I think even if you just walk through the gallery here, you see this in so many of the, the prints. You see women, you see them together in conversation, even like the piece, well, you probably can't see it because it's behind my head. but. Um, you know, this idea of people that he knew, women in conversation, and then of course mother and child scenes, mm -hmm. which there's a couple great examples um, here in The Prince, one specifically called Mother and Child, but also uh, Carolina Morning may be another good example that you can see here in the gallery that, that shows that bond, that nurturing, the sort of teaching moments, and I think all of those are again things that we could pluck out of his his life and right. see in his part. I would just add too quickly before um, Janet um, says it before I say it. No, just like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't no. know it was a competition. <laughs> no, 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 I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, um, but, uh, you know, women show up in his work absolutely um, in those roles, but they also show up in a very powerful role through the Obeya woman. Um, who, what, you know, once I was talking to someone from Jamaica and they said that the Obeya does exist in Jamaican culture, but it's a man. And so when it shows up in Bearden's work, it's clearly a woman of power, um, a medicine woman and conjure woman um, that he uses throughout, um, also a, a symbol of a very strong presence in the community. That's all I was going to say. <laughs> 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 all right. And now Janet is speechless. <laughs> So I have a question to the whole panel. Uh, many artists have dual careers, as you do, and um, <coughs> even after they achieve a commercial success, typically we see this in academia. However, Ramir Bearden was a social worker his um, entire career for 30 years, I believe. Uh, I uh, actually was listening to an interview uh, that he did in 1971 with the New York Times, and he said he would had attended medical school, which mm. is something I did not know. Mm. He, he said it. He may have been kidding. <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, he, he did continue to be a social worker. And even after he probably could have stopped after commercial success mm -hmm. from his art, mm -hmm. can you talk about why you think he remained working outside of the arts during the sort of great middle period of his career. Mm -hmm. We could start with Janet. Yeah. She's been quiet for a couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I think is personally interesting is so this career as a social worker, he went to university, he got a degree, he went out in the workforce and he worked in, in um, and made a career out of this for decades and there's a lot uh, written about a certain group of people that he worked with in, in this position, um, the gypsies in New York. And what I think is interesting is that this never really came through in his work. And like what he chose to actually show in his work um, speaks to so many people. And I wonder, maybe Deidre can shed some more light on this for us, um, how he, it seems to me that he really kept those two parts of his life separate. Um, um, but the art, I think, was always in him. And um, he had his first, uh, first gallery showing in Washington, D.C. in a little gallery called the G Place Gallery. But he really was not taken on as a solo artist until about 1960, 61. So at this point, he is late 40s, almost 50 years old before he gets signed by Arne Ekstrom and he's taken into the Cordier and Ekstrom Gallery in New York City. And there he is given a, his first really serious solo show. Um, I don't know <laughs> why. I mean, um, a lot of artists I know like to um, continue working in other fields because they like to eat. 
Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's just a reality of the job. Yeah. So, Well, I mean, as someone who works in academia, not as a practicing artist, but so I have a lot of colleagues who are artists and who teach. And as you mentioned, that's really what we think of as kind of a more normal course of events. But there's a lot of demands on your time in academia with the other things that you do other than creating art. And so while it works out really well and you're spending a lot of time teaching art and working with your students and a lot of that can be great fuel for your creative practice, it also can be really time consuming. And there's a couple interviews that Bearden did in which he talks about the free time that working as a social worker gave him. And I mean, I don't know that we necessarily think of being a social worker really as a nine to five kind of job. But maybe in a sense it was, and there are occasions where he talks about that it gave him the time and the space, evenings and weekends, to paint and to create art. Um, And so maybe he was able to find that in contrast to certainly people that he knew who were teaching or working in other professions, that it ended up seeming more desirable than what people he knew were going through. Um, And it gave him a steady income, as you mentioned. Artists, like everybody else, like to eat um, and to be able to, you know, pay the the mortgage and the rent and all that kind of good stuff. But, um, you know, without the, it it gave him also, I think, I don't know that independence as an artist is really a good word, but there were other artists that he knew that were um, kind of supported by the dealers that represented them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that relationship got to be a little tricky. Um, There was a story that he told about a friend of his who got some sort of fellowship or award Mm -hmm. and the gallery felt that they were owed part of that because they had been supporting Mm -hmm. the artist. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you get into these kind of tricky relationships financially between artists and the galleries that represent them. And maybe Bearden that sort of separation that this is my job as a social worker and this is the money that comes in. I'm just sort of guessing here, but based on comments that he made in his life about you know, what his work did for him. So you can probably yeah, I would, expand I, on that. I would say all of those things um, I think could, could play into it and be, we don't really know, mm-hmm. but I think a, a couple of key things though is you know going back to his mother who was a force and was always always had probably three or four jobs that mm-hmm. she's working um, you know it was a little bit demanding on him um, as as their son um, and she was insisting that I think at one point that he have a job I mean they wanted him to be a doctor they, they he went to school he did not go to medical school but <laughs> he might have started um, you know, with the thought that he was going to be a doctor. Um, and But he was also a person who was interested in a wide range of things. So he gets to college, he's doing some cartooning, um, Boston, and he um, is playing baseball. He gets the opportunity to actually play semi-pro if he's willing to pass for white, which he does not. Um, but, and then when it's a, it's a break in some minor injury where he's not playing ball that he discovers that he really wants to pursue art. Um, thank goodness, right? I mean, I don't know. He probably would have been a great baseball player, though, too, because this is the thing is he had a lot of interest. He was a lifelong student, and so he almost could do anything. I'm sure that he was, he was one of those what we would call now you know, type A personalities, right? So he can write music at one point in his life, jazz music, just start writing jazz music. And he, study, he goes to Paris and studies philosophy. He's in the army. Um, his, mother, his degree was in education. His degree actually, was in it? education from NYU. But if you are familiar with NYU, which I taught at NYU, and I taught art in the education department because that's where studio art is, oh, okay. um, along with nursing and education and everything else. So um, all when you look at his transcripts, which we have because we have an archive of his papers and his library, um, you see his school record, you see all of the classes he took in the art department. I mean, everything from color to, you know, um, d- design, drafting, everything, because, you know, we've had to dispel this myth that he was a self-taught artist. Um, and he went to the Art Students League, studied with George Gross. I mean, you know, 
So, um, so, so that's something, and, and then I think a lot of people are under the impression that he graduated with a degree in math, which is not mathematics, which is not true, but it was an interest of his. So I think he had an interest in this kind of work, working with the people probably because of his mother, and I'm not sure, I'd have to do my own research again, but I'm, I'm not sure if his mother helped him get that job. And then she dies in the mid-40s. And his father is um, in New York, and he's living with his father, but I'm suspecting that there wasn't a whole lot of money. And, it, you know, and Bearden did not qualify for the WPA because his family was considered middle class. So, or, you know, working class, but, you know, enough money where he was not part, he did not get to benefit from some of those projects that artists were getting involved in. Of course, these are all his friends and, and you know, fellow artists, but he had to keep a working job. The other thing is, like you said, as an artist, um, personally, I understand this idea of not wanting to have your work dependent on how you eat or your rent or any of that, that this is something that you want to do and it comes out of you and you want it to be, you know, separate. You want to be able to do it and you don't want to have the forces of a gallery or any other or rent or anything else um, determining what you do. Um, and there weren't a lot of jobs for African American artists at the time. And so, you know, he was fortunate uh, to have that. And he stayed with it, I think, because he had the interest there with the gypsy population, and you're right, I, di I didn't think about that much, but it doesn't come out in his later work. Although, early on, he did do some paintings when he was at the Art Students League, um, but that would have been earlier, where you see him painting sort of working class people. Um, and in the 40s, he, like he has one painting called Soup Kitchen, where, you know, it's, it, it's you know, a very early painting, very much unlike um, his paintings even in the 40s, um, where he is um, sort of drawing people who are the salt of the earth, so to speak. You know, it's like um, very influenced by the Mexican muralist um, and working class people. So I think that, you know, it, it was an interest. He kept it for a long time because it was a source of income that he didn't have to feel pressured about with his work. And, and Janet's right. They weren't you know, he didn't really get the kind of attention, even though he was one of the few that were getting attention, he didn't get as much attention um, for his work and didn't get a solo show until much later. Or the kind of money, maybe. The kind of money, work, absolutely. So. absolutely. Even, if, even once you become, you know, um, sort of known and there's some critical acclaim, that doesn't necessarily always translate. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but, you know, one final thing that, um, one of the things that I read that he, he made uh, a sort of reference at one point, <coughs> kind of later in his life, about this idea that working with the gypsy population, there was this idea with them of kind of a loss of their homeland and their heritage. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it could perhaps be something that we could equate to that idea of memory that Deirdre mm -hmm. talked about and the paintings and collages that he makes of the South and those sort of <coughs> memories that he retains and for him what was kind of a loss of that heritage, even in some of his later visits that he makes to Charlotte, mm -hmm. he is driven around and he's trying to find, you know, where their house had been and, you know, the school that, you know, he the neighborhood kids went to or, you know, there's these places that he's looking for and they're not there. They're gone because Charlotte has changed and, um, you know, maybe in some way there was some sort, even if he didn't directly translate the people that he encountered in his work to that, to, you know, to the art that he created, maybe there's some sort of parallel that we could draw. He sort of, he sort of goes back to, um, you know, that, that sense of finding home. It's like the journey. It's like when he does in the 70s, he does the series, um, The Odyssey. You know, he really relates to Homer's story. And I think it, you know, when you look at the landscape, I'm looking at this piece now, which is from the Odyssey series. When you look at the landscape, could be Greece, could be Africa, could be the Caribbean. You know, it's like the colors are definitely bright and, and high key. And um, I think he talks a lot about, you know, finding home, going back home, this sense of home. When he goes down to um, St. Martin in the Caribbean, uh, he, you know, really relates to these people who are close to their home, who have not left the island. You know, and he talks about how they are the ones I want to talk to. They are the ones that I need to relate to because they have this sense of home. 
So I think that's something that works for him, and when he experiences that through the gypsy population, I think it really resonates. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Janet, we'll start with you and then open it up. Uh, Ramir Bearden played an active role in promoting African American art and culture. Can you talk about his role as an arts leader and <coughs> mentor? And we've already talked about this a yeah. lot. Um, one of the privileges I had in, in working on the book that we're writing at our gallery about Beard and uh, is uh, that Deidre and I have gone around to um, people who he's touched their lives and interviewed them as a part of the oral history project for the Beard and uh, Foundation archives. And um, Mary Schmidt Campbell, who is a very well regarded scholar on Bearden. She's also the uh, director of the Tisch School at New York University. She was telling us the story that when she was a young person getting started, she was uh, working on her ma uh, PhD program and she went to her advisor and said, I'm not really sure what I should write about. Uh, 